says that when a tzaddik leaves this world, he leaves a mark on the world. Because when the tzaddik comes to this world, he comes to fix the world. And he comes to teach us how to serve Hashem. Mainly what the tzaddik comes to do for us, the Zohar says that the, the Zohar calls Moshe Rabbeinu Raya Mehemna. The, the, the way to translate it to English is a shepherd that is trustworthy. And the same way that a shepherd takes care of his flocks, the same way is a leader. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was referring to Moshe Rabbeinu as this Raya Mehemna, Ro'e Ne'eman, this shepherd that is, that is trustworthy. Why? Not only because he guards them and he provides for them and he takes care of them like a shepherd. We see in many places in the Torah that our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, were all shepherds. And we see David Amelech was a shepherd, Moshe Rabbeinu was a shepherd. We see in many places in our history that our tzaddikim were shepherds. Now, of course, the Torah is talking about the literal sense of it. They literally were shepherds. But in the spiritual sense of it, they were the shepherds of Am Israel. And the same way that a shepherd takes care of his flocks, the same way the tzaddik. But there's a more inner part to explain about it, is that a shepherd, on the physical level, he takes care of his flocks by feeding them, by guarding them, by separating them. We know the famous story with David the Melech, with the, with the older sheep and the younger sheep, that the older sheep used to always eat all the, all the grass, and the young sheep, they didn't have what to eat. And finally, he made little areas that they were all confined. And then when it was time to feed them, he would first let the all, younger sheep go out so he, they can eat the, the soft grass. Then he would take the older sheep out so they can eat the old grass. And then the, the full-size sheep, the mature ones, he would let them go out to eat what's left. So the same way that in the physical sense that Sadiq always takes care of his nation, of his arm, it's mainly in the spiritual sense. And the reason why the Zohar refers to Moshe Rabbeinu as Raya Mehemna, as this trustworthy shepherd, and it also mentions in the Zohar that Bechol Dara Vedara Yesh Itpashtuta de Moshe Rabbeinu, that in every generation there's a continuation of Moshe Rabbeinu. In every generation there's the Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. A nitzotz, a spark from the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu that comes down to this world to be the shepherd of the nation, to be the shepherd of the generation. And what's the main point for it? What's the main cause? that the generation needs a shepherd is because the same way that the shepherd makes his flock eat, so the shepherd of the generation in the spiritual sense feeds the emunah to the generation. And that's the main point of a tzaddik when he comes down to this world. Mainly he comes down to the world, the Rambam says that the tzaddik is for us to look and to see how we have to serve Hashem. To see that, oh, this is what the tzaddik does, so I have to do what the tzaddik does. If the tzaddik moves his hand like this, then I'll move my hand like that. But if the tzaddik prays in a certain way, he's my, my, uh, my uh, example. But in the spiritual sense of it, which everything around Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was only in the spiritual sense. He was in such a high level that everything in his teachings and his orot is only in the spiritual sense. So what he established is that the tzaddik of the generation feeds the emunah, the, 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 the belief in Hashem. Because we are in a world that is concealed from Hashem. The word world in Hebrew is olam. comes from the word he'elem, concealment. We can't see. Because if we would see Hashem, there wouldn't be an issue. We would all serve Hashem with no problems. But Hashem created the world in, a, in such a way that there is a concealment. And it actually, in the beginning, it didn't start like that. In the beginning, when Hashem created the world, when we had the first man, Adam Arishon, Adam Arishon wasn't a man like we were. He was a neshama. He was a spiritual man. He wasn't how we think he was. After the sin, 
he became down, it says in Sefer Bereshit, Vayalbishem Kut, not all, that he dressed them with garments, meaning that he gave them bodies. He gave Adam and Chava bodies. Before that, Adam and Chava were souls. So ultimately in that time, they didn't have the concealment from Hashem. But as a result from the sin, it explains in the Zohar that before the sin, Adam Arishon and Chava were souls. Neshamot de Atzilut, from the world of Atzilut. They had no problem. They had no physicality. They came down here for one reason, which we'll talk about it soon. And then, of course, came the sin. And the reaction, the result from the sin was that the godly light that came down to create the world was separated from the vessel it was supposed to be put in. Because everything in the spiritual realm that articulates into the physical realm starts with a light, and the light has to be held into in, in, a, in a vessel. In the Lashon Kodesh it's called Or Vekli, a light and a vessel. So in the beginning when the world was created, it was created with a spiritual light, and the vessel was clean. There was not a problem in the vessel. But then when Adam HaRishon brought the sin to the world, then the vessel became dirty. But the reaction, what it was, is that there was a separation between the vessel and the light. And that's what brought down Adam HaRishon and Chava down to the level that they had to be given bodies and to work in this world. And the second they were separated from godliness, it's not necessarily that Hashem concealed His godly light. Rather, it was not available anymore. Because I can have now sun outside, and if I close all the windows, it's not that I hid the sun. It's just that I made the light of the sun not available. It's still outside. If I go out, the sun is still there. I just covered it with a shade or with, a, with a, some type of a cover. What I made in essence is that I made the light not available for me. So the same thing that that's what happened in Bereshit in the beginning. As a result from the sin, then the light of Hashem was not available anymore. And as a result from that, the level of the emunah, of the believing, was not there. Because how can it's very hard to believe in something that you don't see. It's very hard to believe in something that is not tangible. If you can hold something in your hand, you believe in it. If you see something with your eyes, you believe in it. But when I come to tell you something that is way beyond your mind, what your mind can understand, and way be beyond what your eyes can see or hear, then it's very hard to believe in it. And we see everything in the Torah has four different levels. We know it mainly as it's called the Pardes. The right translation of Pardes is an orchard. But obviously we're talking here in a spiritual sense that there is four letters in the word pardes, and each letter corresponds to one rovid, to one layer. The same way how we have an onion and we start peeling the layers, and we peel another layer, and another layer, and another layer, and the more we peel, we find out that there's more layers to peel. The same way the Torah is built in such a way. So we know from the great teachings of the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that there are four spiritual worlds. The world of Atzilut, the world of Bria, the world of Yetzirah, and the world of Asiyah. We're not going to get into too much into that, but the same way that there are four levels in four spiritual worlds, there are four levels in explanations of the Torah. Four madrigot to, to see into the Torah. And each one of those corresponds to one of the spiritual worlds. The highest world is the world of Atzilut, which means that everything there, Ne'etzal Ma'akadosh Baruch Hu, is just like a shine from the Kadosh Baruch Hu. The second world in line is the world of Bria, creation. Everything is created in that world, because before that everything is spiritual. The next world in line is the world of Yetzira. Yetzira means not necessarily to create, rather from the world Tzura, shape. This is the spiritual world where things getting their shape. And then the last world is the world of Asiya, which corresponds to this world, the world of action. So for each one of these worlds, 
there's a rove, there's a layer, there's a, 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 a spiritual layer that translates and transforms the Torah for us to understand. So the four letters of the word pardes, the first letter pay, corresponds to the level of what's called pshat. That you read it and you understand it from the word pashut. It's understood. I understood. Moshe went here. Yaakov did that. Avram said this. I read it. I understand it. Pashut. Pshat. The next letter of the word pardes is resh, which corresponds to the word remez. Remez is a hint that you read something, and in what you read there's a hint to something more deeper. And there's another level corresponding to the third letter, which is dalid from the word pardes, corresponding, corresponding to the level of drash. Drash meanings in a very uh, literal way, to dissect something, is to take something and let's dissect it to see what's going on inside. Almost like you do an autopsy, lehavdil. You take a body, you want to see what's going on inside, then you start cutting it up. So in that level, you kind of dissect the Torah. But then the lowest level corresponds to the letter samech of the word pardes, which corresponds to the word sod, <coughs> secret. The secret behind what I'm reading. And there's a very beautiful story that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote the holy book of the Zohar. And it says that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shamaim, Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shamaim and Hashem told him, all the angels of course came to see how come a Yeludisha, a man, is coming up here? And Hashem told all the Malachim, all the great angels, Yes, they're going to get the Torah. I'm going to give the Torah now down in this world. And all the malachim, all the angels were like, What? You're giving them the Torah? How dare you? Because they wanted the Torah. So Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, Answer them why you deserve the Torah. Why do the people deserve the Torah and not these great angels? So Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid. He was like, How can I talk to these great angels? I'm just going to look at them and I'm going to burn. So Hashem told Moshe, don't worry. Put your hand on my chair. Hold me. You'll be safe. Just tell them. So Moshe Rabbeinu turns to the angels and he tells them, what does it say in the Ten Commandments? It tells a whole list of things. So let's go one by one. The first thing that it says, that I should be your God. And what did this God do? I took you out of Egypt. So Moshe Rabbeinu turned around to the Malachim, to the angels. He tells them, were you in Egypt? Did Hashem take you out of there? No. And then it goes on and on. I'm not going to go through the whole story. And then, of course, he told them, you know, it says in the Torah, you have to honor the Shabbat, the Shabbat, you have to keep the Shabbat. He tells the Malachim, do you have to keep Shabbat? No, we have to keep Shabbat. And then it goes, honor your parents. He tells the Malachim, the angels, do you have parents? Did you need to honor anyone? No. And then he goes on. You should not kill. He tells the angels, can you kill somebody? You cannot kill each other. And then he goes on and on and on to a point that he proved to the Malachim that the Torah belongs to us, that we should get it. Now came a big problem because these angels told Hashem, that's not fair. We should get it. So what Hashem did, because essentially the Torah was not written how we read it. The Torah was written in a very deep, deep and entailed way. And in order for the Malachim not to see exactly what's going on, Hashem scrabbled all the letters. He made a mess. He took all the letters and made a mess out of them. So the Malachim, the angels, can, will read. And what they will see is that you have to keep Shabbat. And then you cannot kill. And then you have to do this mitzvah. And you have to put fulin on. The way we read it, in the level of what's called the pshat, the, the simple explanation. So the malachim saw it, the angels saw it, they're like, okay, you're right. You, you, I rest my case. You're right, you're true. We can't do those things. But in essence, the way the Torah was written, was written in a much more revealed way. How we see it, is we see it in a very compressed way. We see it in the letters, how we read it, the Torah, the pshat, the story. But in essence, it's written much, much more in depth. 
And the reason why Hashem made it a, a mishmash is for the angels not to understand it. So they're not going to demand. Rather, they, they will say, Moshe Rabbeinu is right. You know, we can't do mitzvot. Now, the way that it was originally written, that's the Zohar. The way that the Torah was originally written is how later on Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and started writing it the original way. Now the thing is that when you look at the Sefer or the book of the Zohar, it's mainly talking about the five books of Moses. It's not talking about other things. All the books of the Zohar are mainly referring to the five books of Moses. Meaning that when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai got to the time that he had to start bringing down this, this Torah down to the world, he basically just went up to Shamayim the same way, and he just, instead of writing it how we read it, he wrote it in a, in a completely different way, in an in-depth way, revealing the secrets in it. Revealing the things that the Pshat does not explain to us. So it says one thing in the Torah, we see a story, we see a story about Abraham Avinu who did certain things. We see stories about Yitzchak. We see stories about Yaakov. But behind the story is the inner meaning to it. There's a mystical meaning behind the little, literal story. Now Rashi says, and Mikra Pshuto, what you read is exactly how it is. It's not a fairy tale. Everything that says in the Torah, that's how it was. But be, beyond all that, or should I say beneath it, is hidden much more in-depth information. So for one example, we know that Yaakov, who was the third patriarch, who was called the Bechir Avot, the favorite one, he built the nation of the Jews. He brought all the 12 tribes. And each one of these tribes correspond to one inner power that we all have. And it says in the Gemara, as a famous sage, Rabbi Meir, and he said he had the power that by see, looking at somebody's name, he would be able to see the person's essence. And he's talking about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It says also in the Gemara that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was in such a high level that he was what's called the Torah, Torah to and Umanuto, meaning that he was a professional. He was a professional in the Torah, to a point that he was in such a high level that he was exempt from doing mitzvot and exempt from praying, because he was learning Torah in such a high level that he was considered a professional. That's his profession. He, does, he has nothing to do, he, can, he doesn't have to do anything else, just learn Torah. It says in the book of Tanya, that when a person learns Torah in depth, but he really toils to understand what he's learning, not just reading it like most people do, he's really toiling to understand every word, his brain, his sechel, becomes one with the Torah. And the more he toils in it, and the more he understands it, he becomes more united to the Torah. And that's why we see great Chachamim that Sometimes they can learn one, one pasuk, one line in the Gemara for three hours. Sometimes they can learn three days, one pasuk, one line. Because the more you toil in it, the more you get connected and you become united with the Torah. And that was the level of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That he got to such a high level that his Torah was so united, he was so united with the Torah that he was in the level of Shmi'ah, of hearing. That's where the name came from, Shimon. Because if we look at the order of all the, the, the tribes, the first one was Reuven. Reuven comes from the word Re'iya, to see. This is the level of seeing godliness. When you see something, you believe it. If you see something, nobody can come and tell you, oh no, it's not like that. You saw it. This is a very high level of serving Hashem. It's a very high level of godliness is seeing Seeing is believing. But then we have the son, the tribe, Shimon. Shimon comes to the level of Shmi'ah, listening, hearing. This is also a very high level. And that was the level of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that he was in the level of that the Torah was so united with him that his Torah was in the level of Shmi'ah. Because when you hear something, you know what you heard. 
If I'm going to scream now, you're going to hear, hear what I scream. Then we see after that, the third one was Levi. This is another level. Actually, it's explained in a beautiful place in the Zohar how the first three sons correspond to Shema Israel. Shema Israel is divided into three parshiot. The first one, it says Shema Israel, Shema. And what is Shema Israel? Is that you understand the unity of God. This corresponds to the level of Oven. The second one is Vayayim Shamoa. If you hear, that's to the level of Shimon, corresponding to the second parsha in Kriyat Shema. The third one corresponds to Levi. Levi means to escort, lelavot. Usually the one that gets escorted has two people on both sides. Levi was the one who was escorted by Reuven and Shimon. So we see that the level of Shmi'ah, of hearing, corresponding to Shimon, that's the level that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was dealing with his Torah in the level of Shmi'ah. Shmi'ah Shmi means Hasaga, Havana, understanding and grasping. His Torah was so so in depth that he was one with the Torah. And he was able to go to the blueprint, to the main, to the inner blueprint of the Torah and write down the Zohar, which is the original way how the Torah was written. And the way it was done, this is one of the reasons, you know how when we read the Torah in the synagogue on Monday, on Thursday, on Shabbat, at the end when we read, some congregations do it in the beginning, some congregations do it at the end, but you lift up the Sefer Torah. Okay, one explanation is that the ones in the back, they can see it. But a more in in interpretation to that is that when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to write the Zohar, Hashem lifted up the Torah. So he showed him, yeah, this is the Torah how we know it, how we read it. But when you turn around, ah, let me show you the back, the depth in the Torah, the secrets of the Torah, the mysticism, mysticism in the Torah. Everything that is not revealed. And that's how we got the Zohar. For us to understand really the depth of every little thing in the Torah. And of course, in the literal level, in the Pshat, you know, there's a story. We read the story, we understand, we learn something for that. We know many rabbis, it's customary on Shabbat, you give a drasha. They are taught, te teaching about a piece of the Torah. It corresponds to the level of drash. Like I said before, dissecting. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he went already to the level of explaining the sword, the secret. Because we all like the secrets. We like the juicy stuff. We don't like the simple things. We want to hear the good things. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai explained something very interesting in the Zohar. That before the world was created, all the souls were around Hashem. Enjoying the Ziv Hashchina. Enjoying the ray of the glory of Hashem, not even Hashem. The same way that we have now the sun in the sky. If the window is open, I am enjoying the rays, the ziv of, this, of these rays of the sun. I'm not even seeing the sun. So originally the souls were all around Hashem, enjoying this glory of Hashem. And at some point, they got... They got very sad and they told Hashem, we can't do this anymore. Because all you do is you give us and you give us and you give us. And we already got to the point that we, 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 we're embarrassed to take. The Zohar calls it Nehama de Ksufa, bread of shame. Like a poor person that comes to the door and asks something to eat every day and you give him a piece of bread. So the soul says, no, we don't want this anymore. There's one explanation and interpretation that says that they wanted to earn their reward. But in a more of a Kabbalistic uh, 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 angle, it's because when you get something that you didn't work for, it does not keep. If I give you a present that you're not worthy of getting, it will not sustain, it will not stay. It will at some point go away. And the souls didn't want to get that anymore. They were like, no, we want all that what we're getting, because what were they getting? What was this pleasure of Ziva Shechina? of this glory of Hashem, is they got godly revelations. And these godly revelations were 
beyond pleasure for the soul to understand the wisdom of Hashem. But what happened was that every time they would get a dose and they would forget it. How many people of, you, of, of us here, you go to a class, you go to a seminary, you go to a lecture, you enjoy everything that you hear, you go home, you forgot it all. Most people, they go to a class, they learn the whole Gemara, the whole page. The next day, they don't remember what they learned the first day. This is our nature, that we observe, we take, we take, we take, and then the next day, it disappears. And you know, when I became first religious, and I used to study 18 hours a day in yeshiva, all day long, just study, and every day I would get very upset, because I didn't remember what I learned the, the day before. And every time I would come out of a class and I was like, I don't remember what the rabbi said. I understood, but I didn't remember. Later on, my rabbi came and told me a very interesting story that put me to ease. And I'll show you the story. That once there was a king. And the king called all his servants, all his uh, people who would help him, and tell him, look, I'm going on a journey. And when I come back, we're going to make a feast. So I need you to go down to the basement, take all the barrels, take them down to the river, fill them with water, and bring them up. Because we are going to have a lot of guests. We're going to need a lot of water to give to everybody. Okay. So the king goes on his journey. They all gather around. They take all the barrels. They put them on the, on the carts. They go down, the palace was on the mountain, they go down, they reach to the river, they start filling up all the barrels with water, they put the barrels on the wagons and they start going up. And the palace was on the mountain, so as they were going up, the, the, you know, the carriages were like shaking, and all the barrels were full of holes, they were old barrels, and the water started splashing out. And they started getting concerned, what are we going to do? All the water is running out. By the time we get to the top of the hill, by the time we get to the palace, the barrels will be empty. So some part of the group said, let's go back. Let's go back. We'll fix the barrels and we'll refill them. So they said, no, we don't have time. The king is coming in a few hours. So another group said, you know what? Why don't we go back and we'll fill them again. But this time we'll like zoom up the mountain and we lose some water, but not all of it. <coughs> they also agreed we can't do that. So the leader said, look, listen, we don't have time. We got to go up because the king is going to be here any minute. And if we're going to be late, we're going to be in trouble. So they went up. Sure enough, the king arrives and all the wagons are in the, in the entrance to the palace. But all the barrels are completely empty, completely empty. And they're all standing like this, shivering, not doing the king's commandment. I could be killed. So the king calls the leader of the group, the main servant. He tells him, did you do what I told you? Uh, he's like, yeah, we did, but there's a problem. He tells him, what's the problem? He's like, the barrels were very old, and they're full of cracks, and all the water went out, and the barrels are empty. So the king says, good. That's what I wanted. So they all were like, <sighs> never thought they're going to be dead. So the main servant comes to the king and he tells him, I don't understand. You asked us to fill the barrels with water and now you're happy that they're empty? So the king tells him, look, don't you think I know the barrels are old? Don't you think I know they're all cracked? They're my barrels. You know what it would take to us to wash the barrels now? So I told you to go down to the river, fill them with water. And I knew that the journey up on the mountain will shake the dragon so much, it will wash the barrels real good. The water will come out. No, I have clean barrels. Now go and fix the barrels, bring them back, and let's fill them up with wine for the big feast that we're about to do. And this is what my rabbi told me. He told me, now you are washing your barrel. You put in a lot of Torah. We know the Torah corresponds to water. Same way that water comes up from a very high place and ascends down. The Torah came up from a very high place and it ascends down. There's many, many places how we learn how the Torah is compared to water. Maim Rabim. So my rabbi told me, now you are putting in the barrel a lot of water. And you're washing the barrel because the barrel is very dirty. 
you do sins, you didn't keep Shabbat, you didn't eat kosher, you looked at the wrong places, you ate the wrong things, you said the wrong things. The inside is dirty. We get dirty. So we need something to clean it. And the only way to clean it is the Torah. And when I fill my barrel with water with the Torah, yeah, this world shakes me, but it cleans the inside. So when the time will come, when Mashiach will come and we're going to have the great feast, the barrel is clean. Mashiach will just seal the holes and pour the wine into the barrel. We'll pour the wine into the barrel. We know wine is yeina shel Torah. Yeina, the secrets, the same way that the wine is very, it's considered the most precious drink. Then the secrets of the Torah is the precious drink. Then at that time, all these secrets will be poured into us and we would be revealed all these secrets of the Torah. So we know, as I mentioned before, that most people, they learn they come now to a shiur. They leave the next day. They don't remember nothing. Why? One of the reasons is because you don't toil into it. If you now will memorize a verse and you're going to say that verse a thousand times, you'll know that verse off by heart. But if you say it once, you're not going to remember anything. More than that, if one is not worthy of getting something, he's getting it like this bread of shame, like the souls used to get it, it will not sustain. It will not keep. And that's why the souls came back to Hashem and they told Him, we want to do something. We want to earn this reward. We don't want to just waste our time. And that's why Hashem said, okay, no problem. I'll create the world and I'll create bodies and I'll put you in bodies and you will earn your reward in the world to come. You're going to do mitzvot. You're going to learn Torah. You're going to keep yourself from doing the wrong things. You're going to earn your sachar, your reward. And the way to earn it is by becoming one with the Torah. By becoming one and learning in the Torah and making it my life. Not making it once a week. Making my life the Torah so I'll become one. And the thing is that the way to become one is when you Connect yourself to the tzaddik. Because the tzaddik is the, like the Zohar says, the raya mehemna, ruen neeman. He feeds you. He feeds you this level of emunah, what you can't see because we can't see. We can't see the reality. We can't see the truth. We have to go only by our belief. So we need something to feed this belief. 